Hey everybody, it's the Jimmy Dore Show. I'm Aaron Maté, sitting in for Jimmy, here with Kurt Metzger, America's Comedian. And we are joined now by Lev Galinkin. He is an author and journalist whose writings on the Ukraine crisis and Russia have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and the Nation. He came to the U.S. as a child refugee from the eastern Ukrainian city of Kharkiv in 1990 and is the author of a memoir called the back, a backpack, a bear, and eight crates of vodka. Lev Galinkin, welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Lev, good to have you uh, here. Good your, to- your card music is way too happy. I mean, I'm like preparing <laughs> notes on Nazis, but then I'm like, I don't want to talk about Nazis. I want to dance. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's the Jimmy Dore uh, theme music, and I love it. It's uh, it's lively, and but uh, look, uh, we d- we do all kinds of uh, feelings here. And now we're going to get into a talk about Azov Nazis because that's who we're currently supporting in Ukraine. So, um, this is back in 2018. This this is a headline from the Hill: Congress bans arms to U- to Ukraine militia linked to neo Nazis, and that was back when this is 2018, and Congress passed a measure banning any U.S. weapons or arms transfers to the Azov Battalion, which is a, a neo-Nazi uh, paramilitary organization that's formally incorporated into the Ukrainian military. That was 2018, and four years later, we've kind of forgotten about that. Uh, because now, check this out, commander of the Azov Special Forces Unit in Kharkiv, whose insignia remains the Wolfsangel, a symbol used by Nazi Germany, cited the central importance of U.S. weapons and extensive intelligence and assistance in recent counteroffensive. So the U.S. is sending billions of dollars worth of weapons to Ukraine, and as has been acknowledged by U.S. officials, once the weapons get to Ukraine, they have no idea where they go. And now members of the Azov Battalion, who are supposed to, by U.S. law, not to be getting U.S. weapons, are crediting those weapons and U.S. assistance for their successes. And this is, meanwhile, what's happening inside of Ukraine. The street heroes of the neo-Nazi Azov Regiment uh, the Street of Heroes of the Neo-Nazi Azov Regiment is officially opened in Kiev. This is the former street of the USSR Marshal Malinovsky, who smashed, who smashed the Nazi troops during World War II. So now they've uh, renamed that street in honor of the uh, Azov Battalion. So let me bring in Lev Galinkin. Lev, you are from Ukraine. Uh, talk to us about uh, who Azov is and their role today uh, as a force on the front lines of this war against Russia? Sure. Um, in 2014, during the uprising against uh, Yanukovych, the protesters needed street muscle. Okay, They needed street muscle to fight back against the, um, the riot police. So the people who, who gave them the street muscle were neo-Nazi street gangs because they're the ones who are the most organized, they're the ones who are willing to die, and they're the ones who are willing to kill. They formed a crucial part of this uprising. There were millions of people who were part of it. Millions of them were peaceful. They were anti-corruption protesters. But the people who provided the street muscle were the neo-Nazis. Then, a few months after that, Russian-backed separatists rebelled against this, the U.S.-backed government in Kiev, the new, the new government. And suddenly, Ukraine found itself in need of an army. It had something around like 6,000 maybe uh, active like troops for the whole country. I mean, the New Jersey National Guard has more. It had entire warehouses that just had, were supposed to have army materials, tanks, weapons that were just gone. That were just not there, that were sold off in the intervening years. So Ukraine needed men who were willing to fight. And once again, the neo-Nazi gangs provided the solution. They formed these voluntary battalions, these paramilitary battalions that were fighting against the rebels. And in addition to in addition to that, they also played another key feature, which is making sure that other cities that were under Kiev's control, like my home city, Kharkiv and Odessa, did not rebel on their end. They brutally suppressed any hint of rebellion or protest to the Maidan government. So they uh, they were heroes in many ways because they scrambled out of nothing. It was just it was a very Robin Hood type story. They 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 fundraised. They 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 were facing down troops with nothing. You know they didn't even have socks and all that. 
And in the process, these neo-Nazis became heroes and they became a part of um, modern Ukraine. And soon enough, these paramilitaries were adopted into the Ukrainian National Guard. They became formal parts of the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, it was in a, it was ostensibly to control them, but in reality, all you wound up doing is just integrating them. Um, it says, you know, they say that um, Ukraine, you always hear people saying, oh, Ukraine, the neo-Nazis, their, their political parties don't have, act, you know, they don't have uh, popular support in the polls. That is correct. But they don't need popular support in the polls because they have battalions. So they find other ways. Well, uh, how I've written about it is they basically have a veto by violence. Anytime uh, the president, whether it's Poroshenko or Zelensky, has done something that they did not like, they either would have a parade, they would have a torchlight march, they would have um, they would have people on the streets, and they would have, for example, uh, once in a once in a very small while, somebody would try to try these people for the war crimes they've committed, and they would just storm the courtrooms and just make sure that the that the trials didn't occur. So. Um, they don't need polls because they they have they have the they have the battalion and they have the street gangs. So, um, and to me, that's really been the point of no return. The the, uh, the summer, the the late spring, early summer of 2014, when when we allowed these people to form paramilitaries. I mean, to that point, it's like who's going to disarm them? No one. And. Uh- I want to ask you about specifically what the relationship to Zelensky is, because Zelensky was elected with a huge mandate. More than 70 percent of the country of the electorate voted for him. And one of his main promises was to make peace with the ethnic Russian rebels in the Donbass to end the war that began with the 2014 uh, Maidan coup or revolution, um, depending on your perspective. And uh, so that was Zelensky's promise to make peace. And but he was sabotaged very quickly. And I'm just wondering, you know, how Azov and other far right groups factored into that with the threats that they made against Zelensky and even refusing to obey his own orders to pull back. I mean, we don't know this because nobody ever challenged them. Uh, It got to the point where before Zelensky, Poroshenko, his predecessor, they tried passing uh, an amendment to Ukraine's laws that would give Donbass more autonomy. And what wound up happening, and this is a back then America, there was a very small window of time at which America pushed for Ukraine to actually uh, do its part in what's called the Minsk II Accords, which is the, the, the roadmap to peace that's been laid out since 2015. So at, at a very small point, U.S. was actually pressuring, and what, so was France and Germany. They kind of wanted to get this whole Ukraine thing out of the way. So they were trying to get Kiev to move. And um, what ended up happening is uh, they killed like four National Guardsmen. The far right outside just uh, just killed the guards there. There, were, there, were, uh, there was a grenade that exploded. Nobody was really charged. And that was the end of that. Um, so uh, the relationship to Zelensky is very, is very simple. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very quick point. Um, there was uh, Zelensky wasn't even a part of this, but when he first came into power, uh, somebody wanted to do what's called a telemost, a um, joint a television program be- between Russians and Ukrainians, between people in Moscow, people in Kiev. Okay? This harks back to Soviet times. This is, uh, it was a big deal during the 1980s. I would remember it as a kid where they would have Phil Donahue ho- hosted these talks between America and the Soviet Union. And it's just meant to see, you know, for people to see each other as human beings and to start talking and to just just uh, moves towards something resembling peace or coexistence, at least. Um, so a television station was going to do that in Ukraine. And um, Bil- Andrei Bilecki, who is the neo-Nazi founder of Azov, uh, put, out a, put out a video that basically said to Zelensky, this needs to be, if this program isn't canceled, we will be talking in your office tomorrow. Within like a half hour, the program was announced it was canceled. Okay, now this is something that, like, I mean, like, a tiny island dictatorship would cringe at that. Like, (laughs) 
Okay, like how can you have somebody just openly threatening <clears throat> the president then and just say, yes, sir, done. Um, so when they, you know, when they see that, uh, when they see that the far right doesn't have support in the polls, they don't. The vast majority of Ukrainians are not anti-Semites. The vast majority of Ukrainians are not far right, but they don't need to have support in the polls because they have the, they have their veto by violence, and they at this point they don't even really need to commit violence anymore because they've shown what they're capable of, so they don't really need to do much. And uh, how ha- have they been emboldened by this war since Russia invaded? Uh, what I mean, what has been their role in the Ukrainian military and in uh, in also just acting as a uh, you know street battalion in terms of uh, how they interact with uh, with people who don't share their who, who don't share their disposition who who are who are of a different uh, kind of Ukrainian that they don't like? Uh, like, what has been the role of this war in either empowering them or maybe uh, disempowering them? If I, I think if you got like a hundred of like the smartest thinkers in history, okay, and they had to come up with a way to empower neo-Nazis, I don't think the Russian invasion could be taught. <laughs> this is a godsend for them, okay? What Putin wound up doing is giving them the gift of all gifts. This is mana from heaven, okay? Just like as we empowered the Mujahideen in the 1980s, these people are now getting, these people are heroes, okay? Now, as far as people in Ukraine, well, first of all, you don't see people protesting them because, of course, why would they? Because they don't want to get killed. So that's number one. People, uh, this type of thing was settled very early on in 2014 on May 2nd when a bunch of anti-Maidan protesters were burned alive in Odessa, okay? This was about 48 people who were chased into a warehouse they were then burned alive, and anybody who le- anybody who tried to escape out of the building was shot. And the entire international community couldn't have cared less. Okay, that sent a message to people in Kharkiv, in my city, and people in Odessa, is that you try to speak up, nobody, you will be dead, and nobody will care. Ever since then, Odessa and Kharkiv were pretty quiet. So, I don't. I think first of all, I don't know that anybody would be protesting against them because it would be, uh, at, at the very least, severely beaten up, okay? Now, as far as how ordinary people respond to them, there is an interesting dynamic where people try to separate the battalions from their political leanings and backgrounds, which is why the battalions themselves are popular But the neo-Nazi parties, their political wings are not. So, and that's because people see them for what they are, which, I mean, they certainly are brave. They certainly are fearless. They certainly are the ones who stand up, who are not afraid to kill, not afraid to die. That's that's why America always partners with radicals, no matter where we go, because they're the ones who are willing to do this, and they're organized. So, um, they certainly, uh, they're also very great. They're, They're fantastic at PR. Okay, so they do everything from running camps to indoctrinate children all over Ukraine. They um, they have an enormous PR uh, PR machine that uh, is all uh, accepted by the West. So this so this war in general, this has been a godsend for them. It's 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 the most amazing thing you can do to empower far right movements. Uh, it does it by empowering Ukrainian neo Nazis, which in turn will recruit neo Nazis from around the world. And they have been doing that since since 2014. And we can get to that in a sec. But um, it empowers Nazis who fight from Russia because there's new Nazis who fight for Russia. They get a chance to get real-life battle experience too. So just like as in Syria, people could come from all over the world and get real-life experience on murdering, on warfare, and then come back to their countries of origin. That is what Ukraine is now, where on both sides, neo-Nazis can come in, learn everything they need to learn from real battlefield experience and then take it to God knows where. So go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you know, um, when it comes to Zelensky, we know that early on in the war after Russia invaded in March and April, there was these talks. They reached some sort of agreement. According to multiple accounts, it was the U S and UK that sabotaged it with Boris Johnson delivering the message. But, um, and since then, Zelensky's taken a very, very hard line. He said that, you know, now we want to take back Crimea, which Russia annexed in 2014 after the uh, Maidan coup or revolution. Um, and so he's taken a very hard stance. And I'm wondering, is that, do you think the Azov Battalion plays a role in that? Is he afraid of them? 
And does that impact his decisions? I don't want to speak for Zelensky because he's in a very horrible position, I believe. Um, I don't know what he's thinking, but I do know that in the middle of the war, what is he going to do? He's going to he's going to he's going to against, go against these people. Um, I think it's very hard to know with Zelensky because things that he said, he's you can also find other things that he said. So it's really, um, you know, he was elected on an anti-corruption platform. That's ba- that's been that's been his big thing. But he has been his entire platform really has been not having a platform. So uh, he basically was elected because he was not Poroshenko. The country was so sick of the previous president that they would have elected a dog, I think. <laughs> Whatever else. Okay. It's so Zelensky. Did, uh, I don't want to guess for him, but I mean, I cannot imagine that what that he would go against Azov or or any of the far right. I mean, there. Uh, I mean, how could he, or why would he? They, they you know, they are. Uh, they're not only. They've now become heroes and supporters of the West. I mean, I, I mean, everybody supports them in the Congress, in in think tanks, and they're, they're now the face of this new Ukraine. So I mean, it's it's. Uh, I don't think you you know they've become heroes, unfortunately, and which is which is rather uh, which is rather disturbing. Well, let me ask you about another uh, hero, which is uh, Stefan Bandera, who uh, was a uh, leader of a Ukrainian paramilitary force that collaborated with the Nazis during the Second World War, but then fought against the Nazis when they had a conflict. And this is uh, a clip of uh, a Ukrainian paramilitary contingent singing, "Our father is Bandera, our mother is." Ukraine and uh, this is Ukraina Mati Mesa Ukraine who them for you bad Nas Bandera Ukraina Mati Mesa Ukraine So who who is Bandera and what is his influence on the far right in Ukraine today? Um the whitewashing of Stepan Bandera is one of the most despicable things that have happened in this whole crisis. Um, Bandera was a fascist who um, had a vision for Ukraine. They say, he, you know, people say he's a freedom fighter. Of course he was a freedom fighter. Everybody's a freedom fighter. Hitler was a freedom fighter. <laughs> Everybody fights for something, you know. Um, he fought for the freedom to have his Ukraine, which is an ethnically cleansed Ukraine, where uh, which was a fascist dictatorship, which was... Uh, Cleanse of Jews, cleanse of Poles, cl- and, and this is something I've often forgotten, cleanse of any ethnic Ukrainian who went against them. Because those are the three groups that they killed the most. Jews, Poles, and any, uh, and any ethnic Ukrainian, and Russians, of course, and any ethnic Ukrainian who went against them. Okay? This person is a Nazi collaborator. He, uh, his group, they said that they fought against the Germans. At, at, at some point, the Germans even got sick of them. So they kind of went off on their own, and at that point, they were just fighting everybody around them. Um, but this is somebody who organ- whose group, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, he, he ran a faction of that group. It was a paramilitary. They committed war crimes. They provided uh, armed formations that marched into Ukraine with the Nazis. So they were as embedded with the Nazis and one, as one could possibly get. They directly participated in the Holocaust. They provided auxiliary policemen that went out and shot Jews, the guarded Jews that slaughtered them. Um, in 1943, uh, having, um, having had experience in genocide, they then left the Nazis and, turned, and uh, decided to ethnically cleanse Poles. And they wound up killing uh, 70 to 100,000 Poles, uh, Polish villagers in ways that uh, Hannibal Lecter would have found it excessive, okay? The things they have done to these villagers are beyond sick, okay? They didn't even want to, they didn't even bother spending bullets. They just killed them with their hands, okay? And this is, this is the people who um, are now being celebrated as heroes, okay? Um, it's, first of all, Stepan Bader is the hero of Western Ukraine. That is where he is worshipped, okay? And the problem is that after the Maidan uprising, the far-right battalions and other groups, they have taken the cult of Bandera and they have made it across all of Ukraine, okay? Which is, 
I mean, the overwhelming majority of Ukraine fought against the Nazis. I mean, there were just millions of Ukrainians who, who fought against the Nazis. So having this, I mean, this would be like a group from Alabama suddenly starting putting up Confederate statues across all of, okay, and, and saying that they're heroes, okay? And it's, I mean, they're putting, like, for example, one of the, one of the most horrible, horrible um, acts in the Holocaust was Bobby Yar, where they killed 33,000 Jews in two days, okay? But the, the Germans, it was one of the biggest uh, instances of, it was one of the biggest single massacres in all of the Holocaust, okay? And this was German, German uh, troops aided by Ukrainian collaborators, okay? Now, the road to Bobby Yar, to, to the actual ravines where it is, is named after Stepan Bandera, okay? Which is kind of like naming the road to the world, to the ex-World Trade Center, Bin Laden Bulba, okay? <laughs> it's, 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 it's beyond <clears throat> despicable of what they're doing. And the thing is here, we don't have to discuss whether this is, this, this Bandera was a collaborator or not. He was. He was a collaborator. He was a fascist. He was a Holocaust perpetrator. Okay. Uh, and funny enough, and this is really important, I've done, I've done a, a pretty big investigation into the various statues of neo-Nazis, of, of Nazi collaborators across the world. And what you wind up seeing with a lot of them in Ukraine and others is that a lot of these people who are part of Bandera's organization um, fled to America or Canada or the United Kingdom where they then lived happily ever after. We took in thousands and thousands of members of the SS, of people who were directly running death squads. And you can even see, if you look up like the last few Nazis that have been like expelled out of America or have been like, have been found, you would see that, oh, this person participated in a Ukrainian battalion during World War II, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a very um, long history with them including we have a very long history of using them against the Soviet Union. So after World War II ended, we took them in because we wanted people who could then fight against the Moscow. We wanted people who would be able to foment uprisings, who would be able to attack things. So we, we took them, we didn't just take them in, but we made them uh, integral members. We welcomed them to Washington. We welcomed them to... Um, we welcomed them to think tanks, to universities, and that's where they stayed. And they would, and that's for the longest time they were celebrated as victims of communism. Okay, um, so this is actually this war is in many ways a continuation of of World War II of unfinished business, which stretches back a long, long time. <laughs> And the U.S. instead of siding with the majority of the Ukrainian people, it sounds like they're siding with a very small faction of the population that has this particular nationalist identity rooted in Bandera. Yeah, it's it's despicable that we hear that they just, the, what are the two things we hear all the time in the media, okay, all the time? We hear fake news and fascism, okay? Those are the two evils that are facing the world, according to me, and I happen to agree with it, okay? At the same time, we are perfectly happy to then whitewash a fascist, to whitewash a Holocaust perpetrator. And we have had um, we have had just groups basically write like Stepan Bandero, a freedom fighter or a Nazi collaborator. <laughs> well, first of all, he is a Nazi collaborator. That's not a that's not a that's not up for discussion. But I mean it's kind of like again, Osama bin Laden. <laughs> freedom fighter or terrorist? Yeah. Which is it? Yeah. What is, let's get down to the root of the real Osama, okay? And this is being done by media organizations who are just, who are at the same time are squealing about how fascism and how there's Holocaust desecration, and they're engaged in this. Um, and, and again, this is not something that Russia has no part in this, because this, he has been, Bandera and his men have been declared Holocaust, uh, Holocaust perpetrators and Nazi collaborators by every Jewish organization, by every Holocaust museum imaginable. So this is not something that's up for debate. And suddenly you have American media and British media just start putting these things out. It's like, well, some people were, you know, some people think, um, some people think Stepan Bandera uh, is a hero. Yeah, they do. <laughs> okay. 
some people think, you know, some people think uh, Harvey Weinstein is a pretty good guy. Yeah, they do. You can find people who think all sorts of messed up things. Like, and you would just have these national, th this this journalist who talk about how it's it's horrible fascism and fake news, and they they would just go out of their way to whitewash somebody who literally was a Holocaust perpetrator. I mean, it's it's sickening. Well, let me show one uh, current example of how the Azov, their transformation in uh, corporate media. So this is the New York Times, 2015, July 2015. It talks about the Azov group, which is openly neo-Nazi, using the wolf's hook symbol associated with the SS, right? Uncontroversial. That was widely accepted. I remember this at yeah. the time. Yeah. That's why it's so bizarre now. Oh, you got the next Well, let's, let's see now. <laughs> yeah. This is the same outlet, New York Times today. Uh, this month, commanders of Ukraine's celebrated Azov Battalion <laughs> have held an emotional reunion with their families uh, in Turkey, Ukrainian officials said. So, Lev, you know, you've been writing about this issue for a long time now. You've wrote some great pieces in The Nation magazine that uh, inform people about just you know, how the far right was on the rise inside of Ukraine. And, uh, you know, as a journalist, I'm wondering your reaction to seeing uh, some of these outlets uh, erase what they previously reported in calling groups like Azov neo-Nazi? I mean, you would have The Guardian, you have BBC talking about basically saying that their own previous reporting was a lie. Yeah. You, know? uh, you so it's, and this, and again, just to step back, I am very, 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 um, well, I take this war very personally, and I, I, I believe that what Russia is doing is a war crime. The entire war is a war crime. Okay? And, it's just incredible that you can support Ukraine without supporting neo-Nazis, okay? You can do whatever you want. It's like, it shouldn't be that difficult to cut this piece out, okay? And, and, this, is what, and this is what, I mean, the Western media is doing is, it go, on one hand, they're saying, oh, Azov is only a small amount of people. Azov is only a tiny percentage. Why are people focused on Azov? Well, why is Azov getting to meet the Pope? Why is Azov getting um, <laughs> to Stanford University? A medal from John Azov Stewart. <laughs> yeah. Why? Yeah. It's this. First of all, it's kind of like when people say Azov is only a small unit. I mean, you're kind of like, okay, so Marjorie Taylor Greene is like the second coming of Hitler, but <laughs> a unit of neo Nazis in an armed battle hardened. Oh, and by the way, with a long track record of war crimes, as, uh, as, uh, Underscored by Amnesty International, UN, and Human Rights Watch, they all have they all have chronicled this. But so this one battalion is is not a problem. Okay, it's only one battalion. So first of all, it's not one battalion. There's other ones. Azov just happens to be the most well organized and the most famous one. Okay, but even if that's the case, let's say okay, we're going to give you know Ukraine gets to have one neo-Nazi battalion. Okay, surely if if they reach five or more, that's going to be a problem. But as long as they're like under five neo. -Nazi battalions we're going to be okay okay fine why then does this neo-nazi battalion take front and center in every in, in part of ukraine why are they becoming why are we inviting them who's holding a gun to stanford's head okay stanford by the way which not only invited them but stanford did a study of azov which there's a part of stanford that did a study about azov and they talk about their neo-nazi identity Okay, so Stanford is the one inviting these people. Um, I'll give you another incredible example that just is mind-boggling. Facebook in January, I believe this was in January, announced Facebook had banned Azov because Facebook, like everybody else, acknowledged that they were neo-Nazis. And then Facebook announced they're dropping the policy, okay? <laughs> yeah. that you can praise Azov provided it's only in the context of uh, their um, fighting Russia. <laughs> Tough but fair. Now, Azov <laughs> is banned, under, but except for that, okay? It's like, again, but I mean, like, it's, it's you have to laugh to, to not cry, but I mean, this is Facebook acknowledging it. They're not saying this is Russian propaganda. They're saying, yeah, we know these guys are neo-Nazis. Didn't they say death threats are okay, too, as long as it's about Russia <laughs> around the same time? <laughs> I don't even know where they got in, but that, but that's, you know, I mean, that's just, uh, I, I don't have the exact track, but I remember I talked to, to the Facebook people to confirm this because I just, I just couldn't, a part of me just couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it's again, it's like, you know, 
you can't you can't express support for Al Qaeda, but you know, um, except for their hummus. If you're going to talk about their hummus recipe, it's okay. It's it's um, and this is again, this is the same group that says we're combating we're combating uh, hatred. Okay, the and, same people outraged about Kanye West and yeah. his anti-Semitic comments. <laughs> if we could maybe divert like one percent of the outrage about Kanye West to arming a neo-Nazi battalion in Ukraine, maybe just one percent of that. Yeah, and this is none of this is 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 forced. Okay, these people. This is what I'm saying. Like you can support Ukraine all you want. Okay, you can be as hardcore Ukrainian supporter. And I mean, I. I think Russia's committing a war crime, a war crime after war crime. I think it's it's horrific that they invaded. I think Putin belongs in the Hague. You can think all of those things without, you don't have to celebrate neo-Nazi, and you don't have to celebrate Nazi collaborators and Holocaust perpetrators, okay? But we don't have, we don't have a choice. It's apparently, it's all or nothing, okay? And for some reason, this just one little battalion Keeps getting all their all of our attention. It keeps getting whitewashed, and in the in the press, we're, we're throwing away our credibility. We're throwing away our credibility. Who's going to listen to us? I mean, this and this sends a message. This sends a message to neo Nazis across the world. Okay, if you're on our side, we'll be cool. Oh, and just uh, you, just as in a, one final thing. Um, also, the FBI actually arrested uh, several neo Nazis from California, who they say trained with Azov. The FBI a couple of years ago actually had a press conference. I remember that. Yeah. Okay. So this is not that. So when people are saying that this is all Putin propaganda, I'm like, so Putin infiltrated the FBI, <laughs> infiltrated all of these organizations, like every Western media organization, forcing them to write articles about this. Putin in- infiltrated Facebook and made them say that those of his terrorists. Putin infiltrated the State Department because the State Department put a subsection of Azov uh, as a nationalist hate group. They actually labeled this officially. Okay? So all of this apparently is just Putin propaganda and we've been fooled all along. Well, right? Lev, isn't like, because I have people say it all the time. Like my friends that go on their show, they're like, Aaron Mate is spreading Putin propaganda. <laughs> and But it's kind of implied... I know it's this weird thing where now it's like it's it's not that I'm saying it's not true, it's that it helps Putin, so therefore it's Putin prop. So the definition of propaganda exactly is yeah. just if it's true and it doesn't help our, you, you got to be all football all the way with it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, do you have a, do I have a second or what? Aaron, what are you looking at the time wise? Well, uh, we're gonna wrap. So Lev, any any final comments you want to leave us with? Yes, I'll hey, I, I'll pick off what Kurt said is. Russia is obsessed with racism in America, okay? It has been for decades since the Soviet Union. Russia is competing with America for influence in all these various places in the world. Anytime there's a police shooting, you can hear the glee in Moscow propaganda every time the police shoot a black person in America, okay? If you're going to go by the line of helping Russian prop anything that helps Russian propaganda, then anybody who talks about racism in America is helping Russian propaganda, okay? See how idiotic that is? Okay, because Russian propaganda, we should not be covering racism. We should not be covering anything bad about America because all of that helps Russian propaganda. So we can do that or we can start acting like adults and maybe like think about things for us. Lev Galinkin, author, journalist whose writings have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the L.A. Times and The Nation. Author of the memoir, A Backpack, A Bear and Eight Crates of Vodka. Lev, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Hey, we're going to see you in Miami, West Palm Beach, Denver, Palm Springs, Austin, Burbank. That's right. The Saturday after Thanksgiving here in Burbank and lots of dates in Los Angeles in December. Go to JimmyDoreComedy.com for a link for all our tickets and join our premium program when you go there, too.